Hi, welcome at the webinar, how to be the best version of yourself at work. This webinar is organized by OpenUp, the platform for your mental health. At openup.nl or openup.care, you can work on your mental health yourself via webinars like these, self-help programs, health checks, uh, inspiring interviews and more, or get in touch with one of our psychologists and talk one-on-one -on -one via chat, video or phone about your specific situ situation. Today we're going to talk about how to be the best version of yourself at work. This presentation is given by Irene Bakker and Meerte Verkuile, two of our psychologists. Um, and uh, I'm very excited to hear more about this topic. I hope you are as well, because we're going to uh, dive into some very interesting things that will help you be the best version of yourself. Good luck and enjoy. Hi, I'm Irene. And this is Myrte. We look forward to walking you through this webinar today. Not only because it's fun, but also because we learn so much from it ourselves. It makes us perform better in our work. In addition to working as psychologists here at Open Up and I Practice, we are also mothers, sisters, colleagues, and so on. These are all rules that, well, we have to fulfill and that might give us some kind of pressure. Just the same as we can feel pressure in our work. Today, we're gonna mainly look at work performance, but by looking at work performance, we can't only look at work. We also have to look at you. Who are you and what do you like? So therefore we shift the focus also to that point of view. Of course, we all want the ideal job, right? Here, cycling distance to work, meeting colleagues, having a lot of vacation days. Um, wanna work for me already? Guess so, right? However, it sounds great, but it's never really the case, right? We all get setbacks in our lives where it can be at work or in private that can make it difficult for us to maximize our work performance. So how do we keep ourselves energized? We see the burnout rising, we get more complex jobs, we have more choices to make, which makes our lives more complex and it makes it more difficult for us to work and to do everything together. So, also social media, right? How does the other person live their life? Am I living it correctly? Am I doing what I really like? It can be quite difficult and challenging, these worlds. Uh, therefore, uh, we would say you're just a human if this is what you struggle with. But still, we want to take you on a path today in this webinar to find out how you can deal with this. How can you find your path and maximize your performance? Today, what I'd like to go through with you together in this webinar is work performance. What is it? And what is an employee? Um, how can we find the right balance and make our resilience better by going through Ikigai with you, the circle of influence and rest. At the end, we will give you a lot of tips and tricks uh, to help you get this into practice. Myrte is now uh, gonna explain to you guys what work performance is and how to deal with it. Okay, Irene, thank you so much. So work performance is one of the topics of today, how to perform best. But I think let's start with what is a work performance. And for that, we looked into literature. And here you have a definition, a workable definition, you could say. What is a work performance? It's, it includes behaviors, actions or results that are relevant to the organization's goals. So it has something to do with what's good for the organization. That's good to remember. In work performance, we can make a division, starting with a task performance. A task performance includes employee behaviors that are directly involved in the transformation of organizational resources into the goods or services that the organization produces. That's a whole mouthful of words. It means something that what I do benefits the organization. Then there is contextual performance. And that has to do with, do I do a little bit extra? 
that contextual performance occurs when employees go beyond what is expected. Um, and that contributes to overall well-being of the organization. The third thing about work performance is counterproductive behavior. We talk about counterproductive behavior when the employee's behavior goes against legitimate interests of an organization. And these behaviors can harm organizations or people in organizations, including employees, clients, customers, or patients. So let's say when I am bullying Iran or I'm really brutal towards clients, that would, that, that would be counterproductive behavior. Okay, but let's think here. So we have this de definition. When I achieve my targets and I do something extra for the organization, like or organizing a Christmas drink or something, um, and there's no counterproductive behavior like bullying Iran, then in this definition I would be performing well. But this definition doesn't say anything about how I am feeling. So I could work, eh, perform well, and in the same time feel miserable, be lazy at home, um, and well, maybe that's <laughs> enough uh, misery already. Um, so maybe there is mer more to work performance than only what we have discussed here. Well, that's a rhetorical question. Um, so it's not only about the work performance, the output. It's also about what's going on inside the employee. A happy employee is a good employee. And for that, we need to jump into history, a small glimpse into history. From the 19th century Industrial Revolution until shortly after First World War, workers were considered to be the hands of the factory. Employees were expected to pursue no goals other than making money. They could do tedious routine jobs without any problems if they were paid enough. That was what one thought. But this philosophy began to crack. Between 1927 and 1932, a study was carried out at the Western Electric Company in Chicago in cooperation with Harvard Business School. The goal of this study was to see what amount of light in the fabric would be optimal, optimal for production and optimal um, meaning as low, had it lower the cost as possible, so as low as it can be. But there was an intro I interesting conclusion to these uh, studies. Um, in the situation that there was more light, the employees were performing better, were producing more, but also in the condition when there was less light. So the researchers jumped into another conclusion, and that is that there was another factor active here instead of the amount of light. It was about the employee felt seen. There was attention for the employee. Well, and this is th this effect is called the Hawthorne effect, and it's about um, the realization that how an employee is feeling, his well-being, his feeling of belonging, um, contributes to a good performance. And these findings that a happy employee is a good employee stems from this time. And in this time, so 1930, 1940, the human relations behavior was uh, found his origin. And from that day on, uh, we are aware that the well-being of the employee, employee is a very important factor in work performance. Let's go back to today. Our lives are busier than ever. There's a global economy, never rests, and it doesn't help us to 
they take a rest. It, you could say in this global economy, in this 24-7 rat race, there is no time for rest. And even you could say rest is not that cool. Overwork, work hard, work harder, being busy is quite, um, yeah, seems to be the norm. We need to reclaim our lives. We need tools to push back against the culture of burnout and overwork. We need tools to refresh and strengthen our resilience in order to be able to perform. So you could see, in this balance, there is load and there's resilience. And the last decades, the load has been, um, is becoming heavier tremendously. And today, and Irene already told you, we're not going to talk about the load, but we're going to talk about resilience. What can we do to make us more vivid, more refreshed, more resilient? So Irene, the floor is yours to talk about the beautiful concept. Now, we've just heard that balance is super important and that we do not want to get the skill too much toward too much load, right? Um, but today we're not focusing on the load. We want to focus with you on how to better and increase your resilience so that you can form, perform to the maximum of your ability. So you can increase your ability, or sorry, your resilience uh, by living uh, accordingly to your plan. But now the question is, do you follow your heart? And are you living according to your own plan? Or do you maybe follow someone else's plan? Let's take a closer look at that. What is your reason for being in this world? I'm going to give you a second to think on that. How are the armpits? Already sweaty? Maybe some flushed cheeks? Because it's quite a question, isn't it? At least, I think it is. This is not something we get taught in school or we get taught by our parents. But fortunately, there are plenty of ways to slowly find out. For example, the Ikigai model can help you to find out what your reason is for being in this world. And personally, I often use this model professionally, but also in my private life. And therefore, I wanted to show it to you. So what is Ikigai? By the Japanese, Ikigai was founded, and they call it a reason for being, uh, your purpose in life, your reason to get up in the morning. And if you don't do what your purpose uh, tells you to do, you might feel empty or maybe frustrated. And we also see that people sometimes don't know what their Ikigai is, what their purpose is in life. And they find it difficult to find meaning in their life and therefore feel empty. We also know from research that knowing and living your Ikigai will increase your resilience. It will make you more happy and will make you perform better at work and get more pleasure out of it. So right now I'd like to walk you through this model and we will get to work with it at the end of the webinar. So the Ikigai model is uh, built on different concepts. First of all, it starts with, what do I love? What goes automatically? What goes without saying? Where are you interested in? And what draws your attention? Maybe for you this is daily life, uh, seeing your neighbor, helping your neighbor, or looking at architecture, or being socially active. So for me, for instance, it's social contact. I love social contact. Then we look at what you're good at. What you love is one, but are you good at it too? Sometimes you can grow in this field. If you love something, you get enough discipline often to grow and get better at it. So for instance, I like social contact and I'm also good at um, making contact with people. So that helps me in my work. So what are your strengths? When do you flourish and how can you grow? Then we see, can you get paid for it? So does it pay the bills? Of course, a more important one as well, right? Um, we see here it open up that a lot of people work hard and they do what they're good at. However, they still don't really know, can I get paid for it? 
what we then see a lot of people do is they sort of develop this niche market where they do what they love, they do what they're good at, and that attracts the interest of a lot of other people, which can help them uh, find their ikigai. Um, then we see that it also has to do with your mission. So what does the world need? Uh, this is a broader concept and of course we don't have to take it very high in this mission. You don't have to be the world best, uh, how do you say that, creator of something new. But maybe what you do can bring this small, um, uh, how do we say that, small benefit to the world. You can see it in maybe well-being or sustainability or health for instance. So for me, here it comes together. So I love social contact. I am good at making contact easily. I can get paid for it. And the world could use some more connection in mental health. Um, so ikigai, ikigai sounds great, of course, right? And we all want to find that Ikigai. Imagine you know exactly what you want and you know what your path is 100%. That sounds good. However, we still see that a lot of people struggle because pff, uh, we see people work hard, doing what they like, but still don't get everything out of it they hope. And that is where we see that a lot of people uh, are mainly focused at the external uh, factors that are here in our lives. So for instance, mainly concerned with what colleagues think or if all the customers will call them back. And you already notice you don't have any control over that, right? So we're happy to tell you more about that. This circle of influence and concern is uh, thought of by Covey, and I think it comes back to our webinars regularly. And that is because Mirta and I are really in love with this concept and also felt from the both of us in our own personal lives that it could affect us in such a beautiful way. It can really uh, uplift your resilience if you work with it. So let's start with the circle of concern. Hmm, imagine. You're a weekend away with your boyfriend or girlfriend. The boat has already been rented. Champagne's cold. You check the weather. <gasps> Storm, rain. Oh no. There you go, right? <sighs> the weekend affects your mood. You get a fight. Not good, right? Hmm. Maybe a big example, but probably recognizable in some way. So this is an beautiful example of the circle of concern. So the circle of concern is about anything that affects you. For example, the weather, the illness of an acquaintance, something your colleague says or does, a promotion at work. And it are factors that you find yourself involved in and you find important, but you have no direct influence on. Then within that circle is the circle of influence. And within that circle of influence, you have direct influence on the things that are in there. For instance, what you say, what you eat, how you behave, where you pay attention to. And these circles overlap to a small extent. And there is the opportunity to get the best out of yourself. So let's go back to the example we just gave. You go back to the weekend, you rented that boat, the champagne was cold. Um, your boyfriend or girlfriend was completely happy, you checked it out, the weather, and there was that storm coming. And you say to yourself, okay, this is important to me, but unfortunately, I have no influence, right? The only thing I can influence is bring a raincoat or a, bl a warm blanket. Uh, maybe call the boat rent and ask if there's a canopy or something, or maybe cancel the boat and do something else. And you see, this immediately gives me this sense of control, this sense of influence. I feel better and my weekend will be more fun. So sounds really good, right? Well, as I just said, Mirt and I also really find this whole uh, circle very uh, informative and work on it ourselves because I was a star at the Circle of Concern. So I live in Amsterdam Noord, uh, where I always have to take the ferry. I would always be late, then I would be bothered about it, then I would be get irritated standing there on the water side, oh, missing the bone ferry again. So what I now do is ask myself, hmm, is this helping me? Um, and what can I do right now? What can I control? And what I can control is the way I uh, handle this situation. So what I now do is sort of breathe in, breathe out, maybe look at the water, maybe looking at the geese or the ducks there, and just find a way for myself to enjoy that moment. 
So with the circle of influence, ask yourself two questions. One, do I find it important? If the answer is no, then let go. If the answer is yes, can I influence it? If you can, go. Action, one, two, three, go. If you can't, let it go. This will also really help you perform better at work because if you mainly focus on your circle of influence, the less energy leaks, the more attention and energy you have to perform at work. So now let us know how, uh, what you're worried about. You can email us or maybe talk about it with your friends and say in which area do you take control within this circle of influence and in what area are you trying to change something important that you cannot influence. Mirte is now going to talk to you about rest because uh, we can, of course, talk about this whole circle of influence and yada, 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 but you have your physical, mental basis has to be well as well to perform to your maximum and increase your resilience. So she will take over. Well, back from Japan to Amsterdam, let's talk about rest. And let's think about where we are. In this webinar, we tell you about how to perform better. And we have already learned that a good balance between workload and resilience is essential. Irene talked with you about Ikigai and the circle of influence of Kovi. And I will talk with you now about feeling good. Think about being energetic, do nice things, have a positive self-image and attitude. I think I can continue for a while. <coughs> And it's not that society isn't aware of these themes. Looking at the amount of new yoga schools, medita meditation apps, superfood bloggers, companies offering their employees uh, in company mindfulness, we are really aware of the absolute necessity of feeling good. I will give you now uh, some themes that touch this topic feel good it's about lifestyle emotions and stress balance autonomy confidence good relations in our next webinars all of these topics will be discussed today we talk about the performance and now we talk about rest and what do we do during the hours that we're not working and I told you already, eh, we are absolutely aware of the necessity of feeling good. That's not the problem. And we also know that rest is import important, don't you? And don't we? But what do we do? Do we rest? So think about it. What does rest mean to you? And how do you rest? Do you take rest at all? Is your rest efficient? And is it enough? You're very welcome to send us an email and we will can discuss hey, your personal situation. Um, and now we are hey, with our group, we're thinking about <coughs> what rest means for us. And consider this. Nowadays, we think of rest as maybe simply the absence of work or maybe even something that's uh, a stand in the way. <laughs> Yeah, for reaching my goals. It's, it's an annoying um, pause between me uh, wanting to reach my goals. So we even could say that rest is a negative space in a life defined by toil and ambition and accomplishment. And we define ourselves by our work, by our dedication and effectiveness and willingness to go the extra mile. And in that mindset, it's easy to consider rest as something negative. Maybe, maybe you recognize something what Alex So Jung Kim Pang writes in his interesting book, Rest. I started to think that maybe our familiar ways of working and living and our unquestioned assumptions about the need to stay always connected, to keep one eye on the inbox at the playground or the dinner table, to treat weekends as a time to catch up on work and to hold vacations in contempt, actually 
don't work as well as we think. Or, and this is a gaze in my life before Corona, leaving the house too late to be almost in time for a yoga class, ignoring red traffic lights, go against the stream, sweaty, apologizing, sitting on your mat, still annoyed about to hurry. Back in the days, I thought, this is not what Buddha meant. Being always on and a failing planning don't allow us to rest. In other words, rest is something you have to organize and you have to know how to do it. Deliberate rest is psychologically and physically restorative, but also mentally productive. It makes you perform better. The ancient Greeks stated that rest was the pinnacle of civilized life. Thousands of years later, science is flooding in. Discoveries in sleep research, psychology, neuroscience, organizational behavior studies, sports, medicine, and other fields are giving us a wealth of insight into the unsung but critical role that rest plays in strengthening the brain, enhancing learning, enabling inspiration, and making innovation sustainable. Maybe you have already been reading some of these names, from Churchill to Stephen King. All of these icons and many more were absolutely aware of the necessity of rest. And they were strict with it. And we can learn lessons from them and from science. And it's not that, 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 that we all need to become the next Steve Jobs, Picasso, Frank Gehry. But it's so inspiring to, to learn about how they treated their work and life balance. And they are showing that work hard and rest hard is the ideal combination. I have, from all these lessons, I have, um, well, made a, I made a selection and we will talk about four. The first one is rest is a skill. And maybe you think that's counterintuitive. What is more easy than resting? Um, maybe breathing, and that's right, breathing is, na is also, uh, it's natural. But think about the breath. All the high achievers, whether it's physical or mentally, learn how to improve their breath and use breath to counter fear and anxiety and to perform better. It's the soldier in war, it's the singer on the stage, it's the politician um, in the parliament, it's the athlete running the marathon. Everybody yeah, in these fields with extreme um, challenges know how to control their breath and learn how to perform better with it. And the same counts for rest. You need to know what kind of rest suits you. And resting, drinking a beer, watching Netflix, binging, of course, it's enjoyable. Um, and I don't say, and I'm, I'm not <laughs> more Roman than the Pope, and I don't say don't do it at all, but you have to be aware that that kind of rest is more like junk food. And there are other kinds of rest like walking and napping and doing an interesting sport or reading a good book that are way much more effective. It helps you restore and it enhances your creativity and it enhances your memory. One example, Churchill. We all know about Churchill that he was not the biggest sleeper at night, but what is not so known about him that every, every, every day in World War I and also in World War II and in between, Churchill around in during the day stepped back, went to one of his private offices, pulled on his pajama, slept for one or two hours, and then uh, dressed again and went back to work every single day. 
maybe. And he inspired Kennedy and Eisenhower and many others. Second, take rest seriously. It's too easy to think, okay, okay, I will rest after I've reached my targets or I will do yoga next month when life is a bit more calm or so. Um, but in reality, hard work and deliberate rest are partners and they support each other. Hel rest helps restore our mental and physical well-being, focus and resilience and it helps us to be more productive. And the downtime, the downtime is what we need. And in downtime, our brain is helping to come to solutions and our brain starts working for us. But the interesting thing is that a block of time for rest doesn't magically come into your agenda. We really have to make time for it. Detach from devices is the third rule. Of course, this is a quite modern one. It's not that Aristoteles yeah, had to detach from devices, but um, we, as long as one of our devices is in the same room as we are, we, our brain cannot switch off. There is still this connection with the device and it alters our inner world and it alters our connection with other people. So what we absolutely need to do is be in another room than our device for quite a while every day. While I was writing this webinar, my older daughter was uh, quarantined, so me too. <coughs> and I was trying to combine uh, homeschooling with working. And when I opened my laptop and I opened the file, the first questions came up. Mom, where's my book? Well, I went back from the laptop, found her book, back to the laptop, start working again. Mom, what do I have to do? It was the distraction was extreme and to be honest it was really driving me crazy um and what we learn from those uh, big guys and what we learn from science is that in the morning we are most productive and i have been thinking earlier about waking up way much earlier than my children to have already some work done i didn't start yet but i'm truly considering, um, because in the morning hours, when the world is still asleep, you can have a deep focus and you can do so much um, efficient work that the rest of the day you feel the benefits because you already did the big thing. So rest afterwards is more easily to take. So I challenge you to wake up at five every morning, uh, work three hours and then take your first rest. Okay, I understand maybe you think I'm going mental here, although I'm quite serious about myself to start doing it. You don't have to be um, before sunrise uh, at your office. But when you start your work at the office, 8.30 or something, and you manage to ignore or just don't open your email and work only in your own realm for an hour or two, and do that every morning, you will see that you will become more productive um, and you will become less anxious because your conscious and unconscious mind know that there's a routine. So they can start trusting that every day at the same time there is time for the deep topics. All right, so I, I only lifted the veil for you on this very interesting topic, rest. And I hope that it has inspired you as uh, I am inspired by the topic because there is a world to win when you start resting in the um, considerate and uh, proper way. So enjoy the ride. Okay, so do it yourself. Are you guys sleeping yet? Mert has just told you about this whole rest part, right? Maybe you need a rest. We can't, unfortunately, take a break. So sorry for that. But we also talked about building in routine. And that's what we're going to do. Yeah, so we're going to summarize. That was our routine. So to perform well at work, it's about having balance between your load and your resilience. 
Then we said we want you to increase your resilience and that helps you to be in the good place at work in terms of your Ikigai, uh, so you can perform optimally. And in addition, it's about focusing on your circle of influence and about feeling good about yourself. Then taking sufficient rest is also very important. So very nice thoughts of us, this whole theoretical explanation, but we also know you high achievers, you want something to get done and to do by yourself. So that's what we're gonna do. So first of all, Ikigai, finding your passion. I already heard you guys think, okay, finding a passion, what's a passion, right? So I want to do a visualization with you guys. Please close your eyes. And imagine you're 10, 11, being in sixth or seventh grade at, high, at the primary school and see yourself sitting at that small desk and ask that small child, what did it want to become? What did you like? What did you write in friendship books or maybe get compliments on? Because a child lives from its heart and its gut, its creativity. Be sure to write down whatever comes to mind and maybe three childhood dreams come to mind where you think, oh, I really like that. Maybe you like to draw, listen to music. Maybe you always like to help the teacher with uh, giving grades or doing anything else. And then think, what of these goals or dreams haven't been realized yet? And how can I start influencing on this in my daily life? How can I take a step in the right direction? Also look at what you did not like at that small, as that small child. What did you dislike in school, hobbies, maybe friendships? Um, what leaked your energy? And then look what common factor you see in there. Maybe it's about, let's say, all the administrative ta tasks that you disliked or when it has something to do with numbers or more with the social contact. And then see, hey, am I doing this in my current job right now? And can I maybe do a little bit of less of that and a little bit more of what I like to increase my performance? Then Ikigai was also about finding your values and your mission. Also quite a big world, right? So pff, what do I find important? What is my mission? A lot of people don't really know and that can make it stressful. Um, so what we can do is look at your values um, and to see where you can take small steps into uh, following that compass. For me, for instance, connection, development and fun are very important. And that's what I try to do in my job. Again, I'd like to do an exercise and I would ask you to again close your eyes. We want to feel from the heart. What we're going to do is I'm going to ask you um, to let the word that I just give you a value to resonate with him and just let that word come to your mind uh, and then feel in your body what happens. When this value resonates for you and is something you, I think, feel in your heart, your body will give a sign. If nothing happens, nothing happens. So the word I'm going to give you is creativity. What happens? Do you feel a click or maybe some movement in your chest or in your belly? Maybe a flutter or maybe frustration because this doesn't work for you. It's okay. Then we're going to take the word empathy. Or maybe I should better say connection. What, did that, what does it do for you now? Now you can start opening your eyes again. Maybe you didn't feel anything, maybe you felt a lot. Everything is fine. You can do this by yourself on a couch and just start following some words. Let us know how it went. Then another tip we want to give to you is looking at your energy balance. So energy givers, energy takers, and start registering so for take two weeks, that's what I normally do. And I just look at my day and really say, okay, this energized me and this really le leaks energy. 
And then you can see, okay, maybe some things you normally thought was, were giving you energy now start leaking energy. For me, for instance, I thought being on the couch, watching television was an energy giver. I thought I liked it. But then when I started registering it, I saw that it actually leaked a lot of energy. Um, so now what I try to do is, for instance, in my evening, do more of an energy giver. For instance, call a friend or do some yoga or go for a walk. By doing this and keeping your balance, you will up your resilience. The third one is a gratitude journal. With a gratitude journal, um, we try to really look at the, the con uh, how do you say that, to uh, make you feel satisfied, not to make you feel happy, because that's what I always get the jitters from with this whole word of gratitude. It's so big. It's not about being big and being happy, etc. It's more about being um, satisfied and being okay with everything there already is. And we know from research that if you do this a lot, your resilience will uh, grow as well. So this is my journal from yesterday. Uh, for instance, I was uh, satisfied with lying in my nice warm bed, hearing the birds outside, knowing it was gonna be a nice day. So in my gratitude journal from today, it's not gonna be there because it was raining all day. Um, but still, that's good for the plants. We could say that, of course. Um, I've also eaten healthy, which is important for me. Um, and I'm happy that I have the resources to do that and so on. So just take some time. It costs you maybe 30 seconds in the morning and 30 in the evening. And it gives you a lot of nice feelings. And then the final tip is rest. So Mirt already explained a lot to you about rest and the importance of rest. And what we know from research is that actually after four hours of being active, all people should then take 20 minutes of lying down and doing nothing. So no uh, phone, no sounds, just lying down and let your body be able to relax as well. Being active also means reading a book, going out for a walk, sitting on the couch because your muscles are still activated. So see how often you do this, because we think you probably don't do it that often. And for instance, Mirt and I here are the people who lie down in the break, who say after 12 to just lie down on the floor. Maybe some colleagues think we're a bit crazy, uh, but uh, actually we noticed that a lot of colleagues started joining us because it's so nice. So small recap, all in all, this is what we've covered in this webinar. Loads of information. So to take home is if you take good care of yourself, find what suits you and act accordingly, you will get the best out of yourself, both at work and in private, which will benefit your work performance and make you able to maximize your work performance. A happy employee is a happy employer means impact. If you want to learn more, here are some books. Um, a nice talk from Brene Brown on Netflix. Let's open up. So that was it. That was the webinar, How to Be the Best Version of Yourself. Thank you for your time. And again, as mentioned previously at the beginning of this webinar, if you want to discuss this topic with one of our psychologists one-on-one, -on -one, feel free to book a consultation via our website, www.openup.nl, or send us an email via team at opena.care. I hope you've learned a lot of new things. I hope you know how to rest now. I hope you know your ikigai. I hope you know the sphere of influence and you will put this to use to be the best version of you at work. And we hope to see you the next time, the next webinar again. Have a good day.